Chapter 8, Part 2 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 8 The Mountain Battle. Part 2. Harry slept on the ground that night, but the precious cloak was around him. He slept beyond the dawn, as the pursuit was now abandoned, but when he arose, smoke was still floating over the valley and the burned forests. He was stiff and sore, but the fierce hunger that assailed him made him forget the aching of his bones. He had eaten nothing for thirty-six hours. He had forgotten until then that there was such a thing as food. But the sight of Langdon holding a piece of frying bacon on a stick afflicted him with a raging desire. "'Give me that bacon, Tom,' he cried or I'll set the rest of the forest on fire. No need, you old war horse. I was just bringing it to you. There's plenty more where these came from. The foot cavalry took it at MacDowell, and like the wise boys they are, brought it on with them. Come and join us. Your general is already riding a bit up the valley, and as he didn't call you, it follows that he doesn't want you. Harry followed him gladly. The Invincibles had found a good place and were cooking a solid breakfast. They had bacon and ham and coffee and bread in abundance, and for a while there was great eating and drinking. To a youth which had marched and fought without food, it was not a breakfast. It was a banquet and a feast. Young frames which recover quickly responded at once. Now and then the musical clatter of iron spoons and knives on iron cups and plates was broken by deep sighs of satisfaction. But they did not speak for a while. There was lost time to be made up, and they did not know when they would get another such chance. The odds were always against it. "'Enough is enough,' said Langdon at last. It took a lot to make enough, but it's enough. You have to be a soldier, Harry, to appreciate what it is to eat, sleep, and rest. I'm willing to wager my uniform against last winter's snowball that we don't get another such meal in a month. Old Jack won't let us. To my mind, said St. Clair, we're going right into the middle of big things. We've chased the Yankees out of the mountains into the valley, and we'll follow hot on their heels. We've already learned enough of General Jackson to know that he doesn't linger. Linger, exclaimed Langdon indignantly. Even if there was no fighting to be done, he'd march us from one end of the valley to the other just to keep us in practice. Hear that, Bugle? Off we go. Five minutes to get ready, or maybe it's only three. It was more than five minutes, but not much more, when the whole army was on the march again. But the foot cavalry forgot to grumble when they came again into their beloved valley, across which, and up and down which, they had marched so much. They threw back their shoulders. Their gait became more jaunty, and they burst into cheers at the sight of the rich rolling country, now so beautiful in spring's heavy green. Far off the mountains rose, dark and blue, but they were only the setting for the gem and made it more precious. It's ours, said Sherburn proudly to Harry. We left it to the Yankees for a little while, but we've come back to claim it. And if the unbidden tenant doesn't get out at once, we'll put him out. Harry, haven't you got Virginia kinfolks? We want to adopt you and call you a Virginian. Lots of them. My great-grandfather, 
Governor Ware, was born in Maryland, but all the people on my mother's side were of Virginia origin. I might have known it. Kentucky is the daughter of Virginia, though a large part of Kentucky takes sides with the Yankees. But that's not your fault. Remember, for the time being, you're a Virginian, one of us, by right of blood and deed. Count me among them at once, said Harry. He felt a certain pride in this offhand, but nonetheless real adoption, because he knew that it was a great army with which he marched, and it might immortalize itself. What's the news, Harry? asked Sherburn. You're always near, old Jack, and if he lets anything come from under that old hat of his, which isn't often, it's because he's willing for it to be known. He said this, and he doesn't mean it to be any secret. Banks is at Strasburg with a big army, but he's fortified himself there, and he doesn't know just what to do. He doesn't for the life of him know which way Jackson is coming, nor do I. But I do know that Ewell, with his division, is going to join us at last, and we'll have a sizable army. And that means bigger things, exclaimed Sherburne joyously. Between you and me, Harry, Banks won't sleep soundly again for many a night. As they marched on, the valley people came out joyously to meet them. Even women and girls on horseback, galloping, reined in their horses to tell them where the Union forces lay. Always they had information for Jackson, never any for the North. Here, scouts and spies were scarcely needed by the Southern Army. Before night, Stonewall Jackson knew as much of his enemy as any general needed to know. They camped at dusk, and Langdon, contrary to his prediction, enjoyed another ample meal and plenty of rest. Jackson allowed no tent to be set for himself. The night was warm and beautiful, and the songs of birds came from the trees. The general had eaten sparingly, and now he sat on a log in deep thought. Presently he looked up and said, Lieutenant Kenton, do you and Lieutenant Dalton ride forward in that direction and meet General Ewell? He is coming with his staff to see me. Escort him to the camp. He pointed out the direction, and in an instant Harry and Dalton, also of the staff, were in the camp, following the line of that pointing finger. They had the password, and as they passed a little beyond the pickets, they saw a half-dozen horsemen riding rapidly toward them in the dusk. "'General Ewell, is it not, sir?' said Harry, as he and Dalton gave the salute. "'I'm General Ewell,' replied the foremost horseman. "'Did you come from General Jackson?' "'Yes, sir. His camp is just before you. You can see the lights now. He has directed us to meet you and escort you. Then lead the way.' The two young lieutenants, guiding General Ewell and his staff, were soon inside Jackson's camp, but Harry had time to observe Ewell well. He had already heard of him as a man of great vigor and daring. He had made a name for judgment and dash in the Indian wars on the border. Men spoke of him as a soldier, prompt to obey his superior and ready to take responsibility if his superior were not there. Harry knew that Jackson expected much of him. He saw a rather slender man with wonderfully bright eyes that smiled much, a prominent and pronounced nose, and a strong chin. When he took off his hat at the meeting with Jackson, he disclosed a round, bald head, which he held on one side when he talked. Jackson had risen from the log as Ewell rode up and leaped from his magnificent horse. His horses were always of the best, and he advanced, stretching out his hand. Ewell clasped it, and the two talked. The staffs of the two generals had withdrawn out of earshot, but Harry noticed that Ewell did much the greater part of the talking, 
his head cocked on one side in that queer, striking manner. But Harry knew, too, that the mind and will of Jackson were dominant, and that Ewell readily acknowledged them as so. The conference did not last long. Then the two generals shook hands again, and Ewell sprang upon his horse. Jackson beckoned to Harry. Lieutenant Kenton, he said, ride with General Ewell to his camp. You will then know the way well, and he may wish to send me some quick dispatch. Harry, nothing loath, was in the saddle in an instant, and, at the wish of General Ewell, rode by his side. You have been with him long, said Ewell. From the beginning of the campaign here, sir. Then you were at both Cairnstown and MacDowell. A great general, young man. Yes, sir. He will march anywhere and fight anything. That's my own impression. We've heard that his men are the greatest marchers in the world. My own lads under him will acquire the same merit. We know, sir, that your men are good marchers already. General Ewell laughed with satisfaction. <laughs> it's true, he said. When I told my second-in-command that we were going to march to join General Jackson, he wanted to bring tents. I told him that would load us up with a lot of tent poles, and that he must bring only a few, for the sick, perhaps. There must be no baggage, just food and ammunition. I told him that when we joined General Jackson we'd have nothing to do but eat and fight. He seemed now to be speaking to himself rather than to Harry, and the boy said nothing. Ewell, relapsing into silence, urged his horse to a gallop, and the staff perforce galloped too. Such a pace soon brought them to the camp of the Second Army, and as they rode past the pickets, Harry heard the sounds of stringed music. The Cajun, said one of the staff, a captain named Morton. Harry did not know what Cajuns meant, but he was soon to learn. Meanwhile, the sound of the music was pleasant in his ear, and he saw that the camp, despite the lateness of the hour, was vivid with life. General Ewell gave Harry into Captain Morton's care and walked away to a small tent, where he was joined by several of his senior officers for a conference. But after they had tethered their horses for the night, Captain Morton took Harry through the camp. Harry was full of eagerness and curiosity, and he asked to see first the strange Cajuns, those who made the music. They are Louisiana French, said Morton, not the descendants or the original French settlers in that state, but the descendants of the French by way of Nova Scotia. Oh, I see. The Acadians, the exiles. Yes, that's it. The name has been corrupted into Cajuns in Louisiana. They are not like the French of New Orleans and Baton Rouge and the other towns. They are rural and primitive. You would like them. Few of them were ever more than a dozen miles from home before. They love music and they've got a full regimental band with them. You ought to hear it play. Why, they'd play the heart right out of you. I like well enough the guitars and banjos that they're playing now. Seems to me that kind of music is always best at night. They had now come within the rim of light thrown out by the fires of the Acadians, and Harry stood there looking for the first time at these dark, short people brought a thousand miles from their homes. They were wholly unlike Virginians and Kentuckians. They had black eyes and hair, and their naturally dark faces were burned yet darker by the sun of the gulf. Yet the dark eyes were bright and gay, sparkling with kindliness and love of pleasure. The guitars and banjos were playing some wailing tune, with a note of sadness in the core of it, so 
keen and penetrating that it made the water come to Harry's eyes. But it changed suddenly to something that had all the sway and lilt of the rosy south. Men sprang to their feet and, clasping arms about one another, began to sway back and forth in the waltz and the polka. Harry watched with mingled amazement and pleasure. Most of the South was religious and devout. The Virginians of the valley were nearly all staunch Presbyterians, and Stonewall Jackson, staunchest of them all, never wanted to fight on Sunday. The boy himself had been reared in a stern Methodist faith, and the lightness in this French blood of the South was new to him. But it pleased him to see them sing and dance, and he found no wrong in it, although he could not have done it himself. Captain Morton noticed Harry's close attention, and he read his mind. They surprised me, too, at first, he said. But they're fine soldiers, and they've put cheer into this army many a time when it needed it most. Taylor, their commander, is a West Pointer, and he's got them into wonderful trim. They're well clothed and well shod. They never straggle, and they're just about the best marchers we have. They'll soon be rated high among Jackson's foot cavalry. Harry left the Acadians with reluctance, and when he made the round of the camp, General Ewell, who had finished the conference, told him that he would have no messages to send that night to Jackson. He might go to sleep, but the whole division would march early in the morning. Harry wrapped himself again in his cloak, found a place soft with moss under a tree, and slept with the soft May wind playing over his face and lulling him to deeper slumber. He rode the next morning with General Ewell and the whole division to join Jackson's army. It was a trim body of men, well clad, fresh, and strong, and they marched swiftly along the turnpike, on both sides of which Jackson was encamped further on. Harry felt a personal pride in being with Ewell when the junction was to be made. He felt that, in a sense, he was leading in this great reinforcement himself, and he looked back with intense satisfaction at the powerful column marching so swiftly along the turnpike. They came late in the day to Jackson's pickets, and then they saw his army scattered through the fields on either side of the road. Harry rejoiced once more in the grand appearance of the new division. Every coat or tunic sat straight. Every shoelace was tied, and they marched with the beautiful, even step of soldiers on parade. They were to encamp beyond Jackson's old army, and as they passed along the turnpike, it was lined on either side by Jackson's own men, cheering with vigor. The colonel, who was in immediate charge of the encampment, a man who had never seen General Jackson, asked Harry where he might find him. Harry pointed to a man sitting on the top rail of a fence beside the road. But I asked for General Jackson said the colonel. That's General Jackson. The colonel approached and saluted. General Jackson's clothes were soiled and dusty, his feet encased in cavalry boots that reached beyond his knees, rested upon a lower rail of the fence. A worn cap with a dented visor almost covered his eyes. The rest of his face was concealed by a heavy, dark beard. "'General Jackson, I believe,' said the officer, saluting. "'Yes. How far have those men marched?' The voice was kindly and approving. "'We've come twenty-six miles, sir.' "'Good, and I see no stragglers.' "'We allow no stragglers.' "'Better still, 
I haven't been able to keep my own men from straggling, and you'll have to teach them. At that moment the Acadian band began to play, and it played the merriest waltz it knew. Jackson gazed at it, took a lemon from his pocket, and began to suck the juice from it meditatively. The officer stood before him in some embarrassment. "'Aren't they rather thoughtless for such serious work as war?' asked the Presbyterian general. "'I'm confident, sir, that their natural gaiety will not impair their value as soldiers.' Jackson put the end of the lemon back in his mouth and drew some juice from it. The colonel bowed and retired. Then Jackson beckoned to Harry, who stood by. "'Follow him and tell him,' he said, "'that the band can play as much as it likes. I notice, too, that it plays well.' Jackson smiled, and Harry hurried after the officer, who flushed with gratification when the message was delivered to him. "'I'll tell it to the men,' he said, "'and they'll fight all the better for it.'" That night it was a formidable army that slept in the fields on either side of the turnpike, and in the silence and the dark, Stonewall Jackson was preparing to launch the thunderbolt. End of chapter 8, part 2. Recording by Bill Mosley, Bernardo, Texas, USA.